Jungle Deep, 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 the podcast that explores the tropical lifestyle. Hello, and welcome to the podcast Jungle Deep. This is your host, Dr. Jones. We are on safari, and I'm here with you to learn, to have fun, and to explore the jungle. Field correspondent Stephanie Arney from the Honolulu Zoo joins us for a conversation about Sumatran tigers. These large, beautiful carnivores exist at the top of the food chain. The island of Sumatra is the only place where tigers, rhinos, orangutans, and elephants live together, and the presence of the Sumatran tiger is an important indicator of biodiversity in that forest. Protecting tigers and their habitat means many species benefit, including humans. However, tigers suffer near extinction, due primarily to habitat loss and poaching. Most of the lush tropical rainforests, over 80% on Sumatra, have been destroyed by logging and oil palm plantations. Further, despite efforts from conservation organizations, there is no evidence that poaching of tigers has declined in recent years, with 78% of tiger deaths attributed to poaching for trade. That is at least 40 animals killed each year. The island has seen a 50% decrease in the number of tigers since 1998. This according to Conservation International and World Wildlife Fund. Our conversation discusses these environmental issues, as well as introduces us to the three Sumatran tigers that now call the Honolulu Zoo their home. Wonderful photos of the beautiful tigers discussed in this episode are on the episode 14 show notes page on our website. Well, again, we get to talk to Stephanie Arney from the Honolulu Zoo. And Stephanie, say hello. Aloha, everyone. Hello, Stephanie. You're going to talk to us about Sumatran tigers today. Yes, sir. This is interesting. It feels to me kind of like a takeoff from what we talked about last time. We were talking about the orangutans on Borneo. And as many people will know, Sumatra and Borneo are both big islands in Malaysia and and Indonesia area of the world. There's a lot of islands down there. Sumatra and Borneo, are they alike? Yeah. Do they have pretty much the same species, or are the species really different on those two islands? They do have similar species, but the subspecies are different. There are orangutans in both Sumatra and Borneo, but they are a bit different. There are rhinos in both, but they're a bit different. So there are some endemic species that, that means they're only found in that area. There are some endemic in both of them, but they also share some, but have a little bit of a difference. They might have a physical difference and uh, have adapted a little bit different than the other animals. Well, I've always thought of of Borneo and Sumatra as being some of the most exotic places in the world. Some of the most beautiful and exotic animals come from those places. I guess because they're islands, they've been able to evolve into unique species cut off from the rest of the world. I think of Madagascar as being kind of a similar kind of situation. And I know a lot of wonderful and beautiful creatures come from Madagascar. And when you talk about wonderful and beautiful creatures, there's few animals on the planet that inspire awe like a tiger does. And I have been close to tigers. For 10 years, I worked for exotic animal specialists in the veterinary field. I got to be around a few tigers uh, during those years. And they're just awesome creatures. They're just, it's hard to find the words to describe the feelings you get being close to an animal that beautiful and that big and powerful and potentially dangerous. I completely agree. The first time that I came across tigers, it was a 
five month old cub. You know, you see videos and movies of the cubs and everybody goes, oh, that's so cute. And that's, that was my attitude going behind the scenes when um, I was about to assist a vet on a physical. And I go back there and I'm like, oh, I'm gonna see the cub, I'm gonna see the cub. And then I turned around the corner and I looked at three beautiful cubs. And I was just about to go, oh, how cute. And then all three of them, like, threw their paws to the ground, opened up their mouth, got their eyes huge and hissed at me. And <laughs> I seriously almost fell over with fear. I could not believe that even a five month old tiger could be that intimidating. I mean, it was lit and it was even, I had barriers and it was still really scary. Uh, once uh -huh. we took out the tiger and did the physical, it took three of us to wear gloves that were up to our shoulders and hold that cub down so that mm. it could look in the cub's eyes and nose, mm -hmm, teeth, mm -hmm. just, you know, do an overall physical. Three of us. And I think we were sore for like three days afterwards. I couldn't believe that a five month cub was that strong. So, I mean, really, it is one of those creatures that you need to respect. Absolutely. And I got to tell very quickly a story. While I was working for these exotic animal specialists that were taking care of animals at numerous parks here, in, uh, in the, mostly in the western United States, we had a facility. I, I, in fact, was the night attendant there. So I lived there, and I was the one that got to do some treatments in the middle of the night. And there we had a, a kennelman, someone who took care of the dog and cat kennels, because so there were domestic animals at this hospital as well. It's a beautiful facility. Uh, but had both exotics and dogs and cats. Anyway, this kennelman, I, I got to tell you, they, they, they got, <laughs> this poor guy came into work one morning. If you can imagine this, they usually come to work at like 4 or 5 in the morning. He's by himself. He's ready to, to start to release the dogs into the runs. He steps outside the door, and the runs are right outside the door. And these runs are like big, enclosed, fenced uh, structures. He steps out the door, and no one had told him that they'd put a tiger out there the night before. There was like a 600-pound tiger sitting in that run, and he leaped at the fence when this guy came through the door. And so this, this animal's had to be roaring and had his paws up on this fencing just a couple of feet from this oh poor guy's God. face when he came through all alone in the quiet morning expecting to just do his job, right? I don't know how he, he did not die from fright. When I heard yep. this story, I know I, I think I would have just given up and died right there. <laughs> <laughs> that had to be the scariest thing, the biggest shock of a lifetime. Anyway, so these tigers are amazing. And is there anything about the Sumatran tigers? Can you tell by looking at them? I understand their striping's a little more bold or something. Have you noticed a difference? Actually, Ken, what a lot of people might not realize is that there is six different species of tigers in the world. Sumatran mm -hmm. are the smallest of the species. They live in very dense rainforest. The female about 310 pounds and that's your biggest indicator of being able to tell the difference between let's mm. say a Sumatran against an Amur tiger formerly known as the Siberian tiger. That tiger is the 660 pound biggie. Also a really good way of telling the difference between tigers is specifically with the Sumatran their stripes are a bit thicker. So they, yeah, they have a shorter coat because they live in a hot climate, thicker mm -hmm. stripes, and they also have a bit of a mane, a, a tiny mane around their neck, similar to like how lions have a mane. Mm -hmm, so that's, mm -hmm. that's how I can tell the difference between Sumatran and all the other tigers. I see. Okay. How are they doing? They're struggling big time. So all the tigers are really struggling right now because of poaching and deforestation, having a loss of food. All these things are very critical right now. People have come in and we are completely destroying their rainforest to grow palm oil plantations, which of course we spoke about with uh, the orangutan podcast. But the palm oil plantations are huge, as well as paper and timber. Are, are major contributors to the deforestation as well. I actually had just read that from even just 1985 to 1997, that 25,868 square miles was lost in Sumatra. That's larger than West Virginia. So deforestation is major. Say, say, that, say that number again. 
That's 25,868 square miles. So almost 26,000 square miles of pristine rainforest has been converted to plantations. Yes, sir. That's twice the number that I last read. I can't, I can't even keep up with the numbers I'm reading in articles. It just The growth of the conversion of the rainforest is just astounding, especially in that part of the world. I understand that basically Sumatra and Borneo both are just like, it's a wholesale land rush to, to plant up everything, to cut down all the rainforest. And I've seen a map just recently, maps of, of how much rainforest coverage there was back in 1970, which was about the time I was getting out of high school. And those islands were almost completely covered in tropical rainforest. And then you look at the maps of what's left today, and it's like just a few little spots on those big islands where there's rainforest remaining. Most of those islands have lost their rainforest, lost it to timber and, and to plantations. That's true. 50% of that loss has been to oil palm plantations, I, I've read. So then... So these tigers have nowhere to go. I mean, they're, they're being killed every time they happen to stumble, and they tend, tend to avoid these plantations whenever they can. But when somebody comes in, puts in tens of thousands of acres of a plantation, and there's a rainforest that, of course, borders that, all the animals, whether they're orangutans or, or tigers or, or rhinos or whatever, stumbles in there, gets killed. Because you can't have tigers running around your plantation. That's right. It's not good. It's not good for the staff. I've actually heard in Borneo. I heard one of the staff say that an animal such as you know orangutan or any of the ones that you mentioned are considered to be pests. They actually used that word interchangeably. They're like, oh, the pest would get in the rainforest, and I'm like, what? You're calling an orangutan or a tiger a pest? And I could see, yes, tigers are very dangerous, but that's kind of how they're looked at in that industry. Is they come in and they can either be dangerous to their their workers, or could you know steal some of their fruit or whatever it may be. Damage so it is considered crop, to be right. a pest. Unfortunately, because they're losing so much of their land, the tigers are gonna you know they're getting closer to people. And people then are having issues, obviously, because it's a dangerous animal with those types of encounters. But where else are they to go? The palm oil plantations and, and all these other plantations have taken their land and now their food, they're, they're experiencing extreme food loss. So, I, of course, they're going to come closer to the villages where they're smelling meat being cooked and, and so on and so forth. So that's, I would say, is one of their biggest issues. The second issue, Ken, is horrible, horrible. It's poaching. They're being trapped and skinned and either their, their skins are being sold or their bones are quite precious and other body parts are quite precious to certain parts of the world. And I was just visiting with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife last week here in Honolulu and he showed me three huge containers of medicine that had products that were made from animals just like tigers. And it blew my mind. <laughs> and I, I couldn't believe every single box I opened up. It literally said in the ingredients list, this type of palm, tiger whiskers, or tiger bone. I, I was really, really surprised at how large the medicine industry is. Um, specifically Chinese medicine, for for utilizing tiger body parts. We've heard these stories, I think, before, but that demand is still there, and there are markets in place supplying these animal parts from these very valuable, very rare exotic animals. They're still poaching them, still killing them, and still, still distributing this stuff on these markets in places like China. In addition to the poaching, they have tiger farms. They call it tiger farming. There's actually a business in China that raises tigers just so they can chop them up and sell their parts. And that, that, that's just sickening. That's just sickening. So it's had a huge impact on the Sumatran tiger. Oh, definitely. What's, do, do, what's left? Do you know how, what, what do they say? I've read different numbers. What, what do your sources say of how many tigers are left there? There is, uh, well, there's 97% of the world tigers have been gone within the century. And specifically Sumatran tigers. You know, I did just read uh, World Wildlife Fund's number. They said in uh, 1978 there was a thousand wild Sumatran, and today there are 400 
left. That, that, so they are critically endangered. So the number that I have of 3,200, you know, just like you said, everybody has a different number that is listed on their websites. But maybe we need to go with a World Wildlife Fund saying that there's probably around 400 Sumatran tigers left on the island. And that is, it, that is insane. I have a couple different sources indicate anywhere from a few hundred to a few thousand could be. I, there's a, I'm looking at an article that came from Conservation International that's dated 2010. At the, uh, in December of 2010, an article they posted said a recent survey by the Wildlife Conservation Society has generated the highest resolution map ever produced of the Sumatran tiger distribution on the Indonesian island. They go on to say that you know, the Sumatran tigers are doing better than expected for now. And they claim that the, uh, well, say <laughs> right in the same paragraph, there's been a 50% decrease in the number of tigers since 1998. Now, to my mind, that's pretty recent. There's been a 50% decrease in the number of tigers in just, what, the last, what, 14 years or so. And they say with about 3,500 remaining in the wild, which is a quite a bit higher number. But any way you look at it, that's not very many animals left. And we know the trajectory of this destruction is aimed for the cliff. I mean, there's just you, you can't take away all their forest and expect the tigers to remain. And that's essentially what's happening in Sumatra. <laughs> Listening to Jungle Deep Deep. The beautiful Honolulu Zoo welcomes you in the spirit of Aloha to come and explore their tropical paradise filled with exotic animals. Much more than a typical zoo experience, the Honolulu Zoo offers many specialized programs for the entire family. Look into their vacation adventures, Kiki's Night Out, Stargazing at the Zoo, Twilight Tours, and Snooze in the Zoo Overnight Adventures. All of this and more is available through the zoo's website. Visit HonoluluZoo.org for all the information. That's H-O-N-O-L-U-L-U-Z-O-O dot O-R-G. And when you visit, thank them for sponsoring the Jungle Deep Podcast. This is Kelly Camille Patterson of the Velveteen Lounge Kitchen, and I make my lime fellow marshmallow cottage cheese surprise while listening to Jungle Deep. Hi, I'm Al Bowl, film producer of Tars and Lord of Louisiana Jungle, and I clean my lenses while listening to Jungle Deep. Aloha, this is Marty Lush from the Tikiaki Orchestra, and when I'm not vibing with the band, I'm listening to the vibes of Ken Jones and Jungle Deep. Hi, this is your host, Ken Jones, from the Prince of Ponds podcast. The frogs are shaking the shakers, the turtles are hitting the slapsticks, and the koi are blowing the trumpets. It's party time at the Prince of Ponds. Out under the swaying palm trees, the pond fairies are kicking up their heels, spinning in delight in the twilight. It's time to celebrate the magic of ponds, waterfalls, fountains, and water gardens at the Prince of Ponds podcast. Hello, this is Dr. Jones. I believe the better you get to know the jungle's wonderful creatures, the more you will care about them. And as you care about them, you'll want to join with me in efforts to protect them and save them from extinction. I want to draw your attention to the Jungle Deep website and the ways I am promoting tropical rainforest education and conservation. In addition to the awesome expert guests and regular reports from our wonderful field correspondents on the podcast, I am building a website with resources to help everyone, especially students, find helpful and motivating information. One example is the new Wildlife Theater, which will contain a collection of photos and videos of exotic animals from the jungles around the world. Top-notch zoos and other conservation groups are contributing content to the Jungle Deep Wildlife Theater. You will find the Jungle Deep website by going to www.calaverasgold.tv. That's Calaveras, C-A-L-A-V-E-R-A-S, gold, G-O-L-D, like the mineral, dot TV, as in television, and clicking on Jungle Deep in the directory. Check the Jungle Deep website often because it's growing every week. Jungle Deep is a one-of-a-kind podcast that promotes conservation in a most entertaining way. 
If you want me to make more Jungle Deep episodes, let me know by making a donation to this environmental education podcast. If you would like, for a donation of $20 or more, I'll be happy to make a shout-out on the show. That's a short message about your favorite wildlife or conservation organization. You may send any amount by check mailed to me, the producer, Ken Jones, at P.O. Box 61, Murphy's, M-U-R-P-H-Y-S, California, 95247. You know, most people don't make a donation and just listen to the podcast for free. That makes your donation all the more important. The core message of Jungle Deep is that we need more people to participate in conservation. It's not enough to love nature. These days, caring about the environment absolutely requires action. Your action in support of this show will be used to grow Jungle Deep and to help me reach more people with our conservation message. Thank you. Now, more of Jungle Deep. 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 What about the tigers there at your zoo, at the Honolulu Zoo? Can you tell us a little bit about what you have there and uh, what they're like? What were these animals like? Well, we have three Sumatran tigers here at the Honolulu Zoo. We have Jalita, Chrissy, and Barani. Chrissy and Barani are on a permanent loan to us to do one major thing, and that is to reproduce. What the Honolulu Zoo does for the tiger population is they help out the Species Survival Plan, also called the SSP in the zoo world. And it is a lot like Match.com for animals. What we do is we have this massive system where people can look at every animal, and people in our field can look at every animal and see where they've been, what their family tree is, and find a perfect match for these animals so that they can have a very healthy generation after them. So it was matched in the past that Barani and Chrissy would be a fantastic couple together, and they have been. They have had two litters since they've been here at the Honolulu Zoo. Last of the three cubs that they just had a few years back was just traded to another zoo in France. It is a very effective program, one of the main reasons why zoos exist. So we're very proud that we are a big contributor to helping to increase tiger populations. Is that the normal litter size for these tigers is uh, three cubs? Typically. Yeah. Yep. Typically mm-hmm. you see three with, with tigers. With our tigers at the zoo, we have two really awesome exhibits for them. They have a very beautiful natural setting where we can allow them to use all their natural behaviors, such as climbing and jumping and swimming, being that they are one of the cats that do like to swim. They even have webbing in between their paws so that they can swim. And it's really? awesome when they uh, jump in there. I didn't know sometimes that. We'll, sometimes we'll throw uh, a boomer ball, like a big, thick plastic ball that they can jump in the water with and it's so fun to watch it bounce around and they stick out their huge claws and they bite it down with their massive teeth with us it takes it would take like a hammer and a nail to make a dent in this boomer ball and their claws and teeth just bite through it like butter Oh, I would. I would. I'm not surprised. I would think it'd be pretty hard to come up with something that they couldn't puncture. <laughs> yeah, we do. We try. We we do like to do things um, for enrichment. Remember, I, we spoke about enrichment earlier. These are items, mm-hmm. um, natural or unnatural, that are put into their exhibit to enrich their lives. So stimulate them. Stimulate their natural behaviors. So we have given them a variety of things. They love it when we give them pinatas that are full of meat and blood or senses uh. like they love <laughs> smells they love the smell of rosemary and pumpkin spice and jolita loves the perfume obsession for men so we like to <laughs> <laughs> we like to now there's got to be a story behind that one we, <laughs> how you found we, that out <laughs> we test out different perfumes and smells all the time like catnips and rosemary like i said before Oh, uh, sure. You just put them on a leash, take them down to the mall, and walk them through That's the place and say, okay, pick your perfume. They, they smell them, and then they take the coffee beans to get a refresher, and then they smell a new one, and they're like, obsession, this is the one I want. <laughs> this is the one. Okay, now we know what attracts tigers. You might not want to wear that if you happen to be visiting in Sumatra. <laughs> yeah, maybe do not wear obsession for men or pumpkin spice. They might be fans of that. But those- 
the, the well, uh, that's suit. that's fascinating. What other what other quirky things can you tell us about their their personalities? Now, are these what we got? Two uh, obviously we a pair, a male and a female, and two, then an extra. We have two females and one male, and our breeding mm -hmm. pair, like I said, is Barani and Chrissy, and then our older yes. female is Jalita. And Jalita and Barani are actually really good friends. Typically, tigers are solitary. But here at the zoo, we have found that they, they've come to be quite nice companions for each other. So every once in a while, we do put them in the exhibit together to mix up their days. But we usually don't put Barani and Chrissy together unless it's breeding time because they're very good at what they do. <laughs> so we have to make sure that we plan mm -hmm. that out. I see. So you so, actually have to have three, three separate enclosures for these three separate big cats? We have two. So we have two very large uh, enclosures and then a large enclosure in the back. So if we ever need to move them out of the exhibits to clean or to hang up a pinata or to hide food in their exhibit, then we can always move them around safely. Now, I know you have a policy of not having human contact right up with these animals. How do you get them to leave if you want them to, move, to go from one enclosure to another? How do you do that? Well, Ken, like I'm very motivated by chocolate cake. Uh, Our tigers are very mot motivated by meat. So uh -huh. it's pretty easy to get them to move. If we need them to go into I an exhibit, we put a big chunk of meat. So just plus. saying pretty please isn't enough. you got to have a nice steak. <laughs> exactly. And you know what's funny is that, you, you know, we were saying earlier that tigers are actually very intimidating, and they are. And the keepers sometimes get quite used to them and build somewhat of, of a relationship with them. But even when I ask one of our head tiger keepers, Kristen, you know, how is your relationship with them? She'll still say, I respect them very much. We would never go in the enclosure mm -hmm. with them. Obviously, they're not, they're not allowed to anyway, because she knows that that is still a wild animal. And even though you might walk up and they might come up and start chuffing and rub their faces up against the fence and, you know, kind of like, I guess, maybe our way of thinking they're saying hello, still, that is a wild animal and you do not want to mess with that animal at all. Yeah, they have a capacity to change mood so quickly yes. that you just don't want to be <laughs> next to them when that happens. Something we do find really cute is Barani. Uh, he, we tend to think that he's a bit more of the, the pussycat of the group. Uh, every once in a while, we'll, our enrichment coordinator will put a piñata in the exhibit and stuff it with meat. And he's always a bit hesitant, you know, stalking it slowly, coming up to it going, what is that? One day, he went to just tap it. And when he tapped it, you know, obviously tires are very strong. So their tap isn't just a little tap. It's a knock its head off kind of a thing. So he <laughs> went to tap it and knocked its head off. And the pinata broke into two and half of it flew at him. And the other half flew the other direction. It scared him so much. He jumped and ran away from it. This is a tiger, Ken. <laughs> yeah, that must have looked pretty silly, really, <laughs> to it, see that. <laughs> when Jalita and Chrissy see those pinatas, it is incredible. They stalk it slowly, and then all of a sudden they just take off, and they pounce it, and they rip it apart just like they would an animal My word. wild. And it is incredible to see a tiger jump up at a pinata that we have hanging from a tree. It, it's just awe-inspiring every time. Oh, I bet. Yes, yes. And it wouldn't make me feel any better seeing the, 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 the meat and the blood <laughs> after they rip it open. But I guess you're getting a real reenactment of, of, indeed, what happens in the wild. Often, as I understand, these guys need to eat about 45 pounds of meat at a sitting. That's a, that's a, lot, of, a lot of meat. I can't imagine eating anything close to that. <laughs> Yeah, that's they do eat a lot. And in the wild, they the males will have a really large territory and they can walk around twenty miles a night looking to try to eat that much meat. <laughs> Hopefully. Yeah, they gotta be looking all the time, I imagine, if they're always on the hunt. That's fascinating stuff. I wish I was nearby and I could come visit these cats for myself because I, I just I have so much love and respect for these animals. They're very, very impressive. Before we wrap this up, I think maybe we should talk a little bit about what people 
can do, average ordinary people that are listening to this podcast can maybe do to help these poor tigers because their days are numbered and unless we do something, something's got to change because the writing's on the wall and it's it's got to be changed. Something's got to happen differently. What can what can an average person do that would make any difference as far as these tigers are concerned? Well, first of all, I would like you all to know that since 1937, three tigers have become extinct. A lot of people might not know about the Balinese, the Caspian, and the Javan. If we keep going on the track that we're going, we're going to lose the Sumatran tiger as well. Some organizations I, I know and trust, WWF, Panthera.org, the National Fish and Wildlife, and the Save the Tiger Fund are all great organizations that are doing things at a very large scale, such as improving the palm, paper, and timber industries. They are buying and protecting land. They're monitoring tigers' numbers and how much their habitat use. They're watching poachers. They're removing snares and traps and working on these wildlife crimes. And most importantly, they're educating the locals so that they don't take any part in any of this deforestation and poaching, which is extremely important. Ken and I, we've talked about that many times about how education and awareness is probably the most important. But in general, I would say the average person, what we can do is always donating money to these organizations because that money goes to the things I just said and is a very important donation. Also raising awareness, never purchase anything made from a tiger, whether that be tiger skin or tiger body parts that have been crushed up and put into Chinese medicinals. Please do not purchase those or have any part of them. Decrease the amount of palm oil, paper, and timber usage in your daily life. That even means toilet paper and paper towels, my friends. Cycle as much as you can so we don't have such a demand on these items. And of course, if you visit zoos or nonprofit organizations, wildlife sanctuaries, that a lot of the donations go towards organizations that help protect endangered animals and endangered habitats. That's a great list, and that I think they're all valuable points. I, I just feel the need to underscore the fact that donations are needed, and of course, volunteering if you can. In fact, we, we've just recorded and, and are publishing a, another podcast here about uh, volunteer tourism. And there's places you can go on vacation to to help nonprofits preserve various aspects of, of the tropical environment. But for most of us, the easiest thing we could do is to make a donation. And I'd have to make the point: look, these nonprofits that are doing these very important things. The, the items you listed there are just common sense and obviously important to need to be done. They're not getting done sufficiently. These people aren't getting enough support. They're not getting enough money. If they were, we wouldn't be facing the predicament that we are with the environment and the loss of these beautiful species. So we have to do more and we gotta find more people to join in and help out. So very important stuff. All of us can be doing a, just a, a little bit more to make a big difference by working together on this stuff. Absolutely, it takes more of us. We, we really need your help, folks. All zoos, wildlife sanctuaries, all these different organizations, podcasts, TV shows. We are all trying to reach you because we need your help. So if you do love these animals and you do love your habitats and environments all around the world, please do what you can to help us out. Because you know what? You live on this earth too. You need air from trees <laughs> and you do not want to live in a place that's polluted. So please be a team player, put in your effort, and we'll thank you, and so will the world. Very well said, Stephanie, once again. It's terrific having you on the show. I wish we weren't out of time. I could talk to you forever. But we're going to have to say goodbye <laughs> until next time when you'll have another interesting species to talk about or another aspect of zoo life to share with us. And I so much appreciate your contributions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ken. Everybody have a wonderful day. Be sure to share Jungle Deep Podcast with your friends and co-workers. The show is my creation and at my personal expense. It is not currently subsidized by any business or organization. Audience growth is especially important for Jungle Deep to succeed and prosper. So share the show. You can see beautiful photos and learn more about Jungle Deep at our website, calaverasgold.tv. Now that's Spanish, Calaveras, C-A-L-A-V-E-R-A-S, gold. G-O-L-D, like the mineral, dot TV, like television. You gotta check it out. Where else can you go for this kind of fun? Just click on the Jungle Deep title in the header directory. Our show notes pages have valuable links for you. 
I invite you to email me at jungledeep at calaverasgold.tv and follow me on Twitter. Search for Jungle Deep or Ken Jones 56, all one word. I would love to hear your ideas for the show. Well, the show's over for today, so it's time to refill my Mai Tai, mount my elephant, and head back into the jungle. Thank you.